apocalypse. It's a big word, isn't it? 2012 and how the world will really end. Some years ago in Australia, one of our columnists in our newspaper, The Weekend in Review, Philip Adams, made an interesting column or wrote an interesting column. He called it, It's Apocalypse Now, But How? And he wrote on a number of different ways, scenarios, that people believe the world is going to end, different ways. Notice what Philip Adams mentioned in his column. He said, first of all, in these 10 scenarios, number one, he said there's going to be a, a nuclear or biological attack by some terrorists. That's what some people believe is how we're going to end, the world is going to end, blown up, sayonara, by some terrorist or some biological germ warfare or something. Scenario number two, Adams went on to say, is the threat of epidemics. The super germs are coming, the bugs. You know, all the various diseases are going to swamp the planet and that's how we're all going to end. The world is going to end. Scenario number three, he said, was the hole in the ozone layer is getting bigger and bigger and some people believe we're all going to fry to death. That's a nice way to finish, isn't it? Scenario number four, we're going to run out of oxygen. We're all going to be like that bird we talked about this morning, die of oxygen starvation. We're going to be asphyxiated. That's how some people believe the world is going to end. Number five, an asteroid. It's going to smash into the planet and cause all sorts of problems like tsunamis. By the way, many people really believe that. I was listening to a documentary on television in Australia, radio I should say in Australia, and they were talking about this threat of asteroids smashing into the planet, number five. Scenario number six, genetic bioengineering. We're getting so clever working with the DNA and all those sorts of things that we're just going to cause so much trouble it's going to wipe us out. Number six scenario. Scenario number seven, religious extremists. We've had some of them, like David Koresh in Waco some years ago, and he's not the only one. There's been many of them. These extremists are going to take people with them and, you know, we're all just going to wipe ourselves out somehow, some way. That's how it's going to end, say some people. Scenario number eight in Philip Adams' newspaper column, social disintegration and ethnic cleansing. We're going to wipe each other out, much like happens in some places like the Nazis in the Holocaust, killing all those Jews, or what happens in some other places. In, uh, we've heard of what happened in Serbia and Bosnia and so on, and other places around the world, Rwanda. This is how we're going to finish the world. We're just going to kill each other off in warfare and in ethnic cleansing. Scenario number nine, overpopulation. A real worry by many today. Too many mouths to feed and we're going to fight each other to get the food. That's how it's going to end. Scenario number nine. The last one that Philip Adams wrote about was we're going to starvation by water depletion. We're going to run out of water. The crops are not going to grow and we're all going to die of thirst or something like that. Philip Adams finished his column by saying, have a nice day. Well, you'd have a nice day after you read all that lot for morning breakfast, wouldn't you? <laughs> what a way to start the day with all those 10 scenarios. But my friends, Philip Adams did not mention the 11th scenario, the real one. The real one that is going to happen. And that is how the world will really end. The end of the world we saw the other evenings takes place during the, or at the return of Jesus the Christ. This is the one Adam should have had, the only one. Because that's what the Bible says is the way the world as we understand it, the way the world it is, is going to end. There are many people right now around the world who believe at the end of this year, about December 21, the world is going to end. 2012. 
You might have seen or heard of that Hollywood film where a tidal wa wave wi rolls over the Himalayan mountains and that's the end. Many people believe the end of the world because of the Mayan calendar. Now let me just say a few things about the Mayan calendar. The Mayan calendar does not say the world is going to an end. The Mayan calendar simply runs out at the end of this year. Those who are archaeologists and who study the Mayan religion do not see anything in the Mayan calendar to say the world is going to end. But some people suggest that. Some people have even said that Nostradamus also predicts the end of the world in 2012. My friends, the Bible tells us that astrology is not a, a safe way to try to know the future. Nostradamus was a French psychic and an astrologer whose predictions have said to, make, to predict many things. But when a person is involved in astrology, you know they're not speaking for God because the Bible says astrology is not a safe way to try to know the future. That's clearly what the Bible says. You remember when Daniel the prophet, he was able to give the king what his dream meant. He was able to help the king know the future, but sadly the astrologers were not able to help the king. There is a reliable source for knowing the future. It is the Bible. My friend, we don't need to worry about 2012. They say December 21, 2012. The Bible says nobody knows the day or the hour, the time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not need to be afraid of what Hollywood portrays. And the Mayans do not have a proven track record for predicting the future. They have left us with no predictions of theirs from the past that we can say, well, this has happened in their past. They've predicted this and this and this. They don't have any track record for predicting the future, but the Bible does. We have seen in this series of meetings that again and again and again, this book not only predicts the future, but it happens. It has a proven track record. This is where we need to get our information from for knowing the future. We do not need to worry about the Mayan calendar and the end of the world. Some people who believe in the Mayan calendar, they don't even think the end of the world is going to end. They believe it's going to be a new age or something, a dawning of a new period of time. You see, there's disagreement between the very people who talk about the Mayan calendar and the predictions of Nostradamus and so on among themselves. But the Bible is very clear, my friend. God knows the future and he wants you and I to know the future. And he knows that the return of Jesus is what is going to end the world as it is at the moment. How will the 11th scenario, the return of Jesus Christ, play out? What's going to happen in the end? We're going to answer that question this afternoon. But we're also going to deal with another question, and that is, why is Jesus Christ coming back? What's the purpose of this return? How is it going to happen, and why is it going to happen? Let's begin with the, first, the second question first. Why is Jesus returning? Well, one of the most hope-filled things is the return of Jesus. He is coming back, first of all, to raise his friends who have died, he's going to raise them to life again. Death is not the end for the friends of God. Notice what Paul, the friend of Jesus, said so long ago when he was writing to his friends in the little city of Thessalonica in Greece or Macedonia. Paul, as he wrote to his friends, knew that they did not have hope beyond the grave. They thought death was a black hole. That was it. Notice what Paul said, however, to correct their misunderstanding of what this book says. He said, for the Lord himself, Jesus, he will descend, he will come down from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead 
in Christ will rise first. My friends, if you've said goodbye to a loved one, if the doctor has said to you, prepare your life because you have terminal cancer, you are not going to live much beyond this year. My friend, if your life is in the hands of God, you will be raised from the dead and so will your loved ones in Christ. That is the marvellous teaching of this book. Christ is coming to raise his friends to life. Death is not the end. The cold, clammy hand of death, its power has been broken by Jesus when he died on the cross and he rose again from the dead. Remember we saw, I have the keys of death and the grave, said Jesus. He's coming to reunite his friends, the Bible says. You might have said goodbye to a loved one. It's hard to say goodbye, is it not? As we stand around that open grave at the funeral, we cry ourselves to sleep after saying goodbye. But my friends, Jesus is going to reunite his friends. Notice what Paul said in this same passage. He said, then we, that is we who are alive, who haven't died when Jesus comes, he comes before we have a chance to die, he returns. We who are alive and remain, we will be caught up together, together with them, our loved ones, to meet the Lord in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and from then on, we will be with the Lord forever. My friend, what a day that is going to be when loved ones will be reunited, never to be parted again. When that resurrection morning comes, when Jesus comes through the sky, I want to be at a cemetery. I reckon that'll be neat. Imagine little children back in the arms of their mothers. The last time mummy saw her little child was just before that truck tragically ran them down. What a day that's going to be when little children are reunited in the arms of their parents. Oh, my friend, what a day, a day of reunion. No wonder the Bible says this is the blessed hope. We'll see our loved ones again. God is going to give his friends new young bodies. Did you know that? Some of us here today and watching at the various downlink sites and around the world, our body parts are wearing out, right? I remember when I first had to wear glasses, I used to pride myself on my 2020, whatever it is, vision. And then one day I was in Canberra and I thought they don't make these, these street directories like they used to make it. I can hardly read the thing. And I realized after a while, it's my eyes are going. <laughs> I can't see like I once saw. Some of you have got backs that don't work like they used to work. Some of us have got more serious problems than that. We know that our body just won't move like it should move. Some have never known anything else but a wheelchair. Some have never known anything else but blindness. Some have always been deaf and never to be able to hear someone say, I love you, my friend. God is going to give us new bodies when Jesus comes. Look what the Bible says. Paul is writing to his friends in the city of Corinth now. Paul went to many places spreading the good news of Jesus and he used to write to his friends. Look what he wrote to his friends in Corinth. Behold, I tell you a mystery, a wonderful truth from the Bible. We will not all sleep, which is another way of saying we're not all going to die in this book. We will not all die but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. That means we can't get old and our body parts wear out and eventually slip into the grave. We shall be raised incorruptible and we will be changed but when this corruptible, this body of mine, which can wear out and yours too, when it 
has put on incorruption, has a body that can no longer wear out. And this mortal, this person, you and I who can die, when we become immortal, we can never die. There's coming a day when Jesus comes. This mortal has put on immortality. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. What a day, my friend. No wonder Jesus said, I'm coming again. I'm coming again. I want to give my friends new bodies. What an amazing thing. Can't you imagine when children who have only known a wheelchair, they are going to run like the wind. We are all going to be forever young in that day when Jesus comes. I notice some actors and some people who are not actors as they start to get some wrinkles they want to get some body tucks and all sorts of things get rid of those wrinkles listen my friend this side of the coming of Jesus your wrinkles are going to take you eventually you're going to end in death unless Jesus comes and we're all going to get old you young people don't believe that right now. Just wait a few years and you'll feel the pain and the aches and you'll have the problems too. But there's coming a day. There is coming a day when Jesus is going to give us new bodies. We're going to be forever young. Powerful bodies, Jesus, Paul says, like Christ with eternal life, eternal vigor. Notice what the Bible says. He says, Paul is writing to his Christian friends, he reminds them, we are citizens of heaven. This world is not our home, in other words. One day it will be, but we are citizens of heaven and are eagerly awaiting for our Saviour from there, to come from there, who has power over everything. And he will make these poor bodies of ours like his own glorious body. When Jesus came out of the grave, he was never to die again. We are going to be like Christ, having new bodies, says this great friend of Jesus, Paul. Four good reasons for the return of Jesus. Here's the fourth one. He's going to take his friends to live with him. This is an amazing, amazing truth of the Bible in its predictions. Notice what it says. Do not let, Jesus is talking now, he's talking to his followers on the night before he died. He said these words, do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't be anxious, don't be worried about the future, he was saying. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, he said. And then he said these words, I go to prepare a place for you. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again. My friend, where is Jesus taking us? Where is the Father's home? The Father's home where Jesus said, I'm going back to prepare a place for you and I'm coming from there back here for you. The Father's place is what we call heaven. We say it every time we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who is in heaven. That great place, the center of the universe where God He's going to take us there. He's gone to prepare a place for us. And if I come, I will come again and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am, said Jesus. That's where the Father's house was. We just saw where he's taking us, home to heaven. Amazing, amazing truth that God's word shares with us. What a hope, my friend. What a hope. No wonder Paul wrote these words to his friends. Looking, notice what he said. I hope I will come back, Jesus said. And Paul said, we have this hope. I have not forgotten you, Jesus said. I'm going to return and take you home. No wonder it's called the blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope, said Paul. The glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. 
Oh, my friend, there is nothing to fear for the future when our life are in the hands of God. We'll raise to life. Should we die, God will raise his friends. He's going to reunite his friends with each other. He's going to give his friends new young bodies. He's going to take his friends to be with him. You know, my friend, this morning, this afternoon, you read the writings of the Bible and you will see that those people of Bible times longed for the coming of Jesus. The Bible ends with these words, even so come, Lord Jesus. A person who loves Jesus will want him to return so that he can be with him, so that God can restore what was lost when the devil took it all away. But I want you to notice we are more than the friends of Jesus. He's coming for his friends, raise his friends. We are more than the friends of Jesus in this book. Notice how God sees you and I who love Jesus and have given our life to him. Jesus takes this passage out of Hebrew wedding imagery when he says, don't be afraid, don't be troubled, don't let your hearts be troubled. I will come again and take you to my father's house. That's from Hebrew wedding language picture. You see, when a young lady and a young man in Bible times were going to get married, they would have a special meal together, drink some grape juice together, and then the young man would go to his father's house to prepare a room in his father's house for his new bride. Meanwhile, the bride, the young girl who was betrothed, they were engaged but not yet married officially, she was waiting back in her parents' home, always ready, her bags packed. She never knew when this young man was coming to her home to pick her up to take her to his father's house so she would wait. And then he would come and take her to his father's house. Now, Jesus uses the language of a marriage here because you and I are more than friends. We are his beloved people. He loves us like a husband. A true husband loves his wife. That's why the Bible in the book of Revelation portrays God's people, his church, as his own body, his bride, like a woman. He says, the bride of Christ. Notice what John says in the Revelation. The marriage of the Lamb, the marriage of Jesus who died for us has come. It's time for that wedding ceremony. And his wife, you and I, have made ourselves ready. She was given fine linen, bright and pure, to clothe herself. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints or his people. Where did, we get, where did God's people get that righteousness from? They came to Calvary and Jesus clothed them with his righteousness. That's the amazing gift of God that we talked about this morning. Just as I am without one plea, I claim Christ and he clothes me and I also become his bride when I'm clothed with his beautiful righteous robe. He said to me, right, blessed are they that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now it's time. When that bride was picked up by her husband-to-be, he came to her home and took her to his father's home. They would have a huge wedding meal together, a supper. And the marriage was then consummated in ancient times. Jesus is coming to take his people home to his father's house because he wants us to live with him just like a bride and husband live together, so to speak. We are loved by God much more than just any friend. What amazing truth of the Bible, the return of Jesus for his friends. But he's coming to deliver his friends from their enemies finally. That's why Jesus comes the second time, he has to deliver them from their enemies, from those who have lost their moral compass. They no longer are following and are not willing to follow God's word 
and his commands. Those who cling to know and sin, they hold on to it. They will not let it go. They will not repent. They cling to sin. These people become the enemies of God's friends. We are going to see in this next week that sadly people will follow the dragon in the end of time. And the dragon will use two powers to get them to follow him. The beast that comes up out of the sea and the beast that comes up out of the land, which we're going to understand very clearly during this program. These people follow those powers to destruction, sadly, because they cling to sin. They believe even lies that John says are going to take place in the end of time. We'll see that. These people who cling to sin actually turn on their friends and they become the enemies of God's friends in the end of time. And they begin to attack God's faithful people all around the world who love him. This is the picture we have in the Revelation and the book of Daniel and by Jesus himself when he gave predictions. So Jesus has to come to rescue them. And John sees Jesus like he's coming on a horse. He's not going to ride down the sky on a real horse. It's a picture of someone coming to deliver from the, their enemies. Just like a king came to rescue his people from enemies who were taking them captive. So this is the picture John sees. Jesus coming, as it were, down the skyways to rescue his people. He returns to rescue his people from their enemies in the end of time. What a beautiful picture. Jesus coming, returning to take his people who are under attack. He's coming to rescue them, to take them home to his father's house. A beautiful picture, the Bible says. That's why John says, the marriage of the lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. She's ready to be picked up. She's accepted Jesus, walking in the footsteps of Jesus, having God's laws written on her heart. She's walking because she loves Jesus, because of what he's done for her on the cross of Calvary. Then John sees, as he sees that bride is ready, he sees Jesus coming on a horse. Notice what the Bible says. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on him judges and makes war, and his name is called the Word of God. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations, those who are attacking his friends, those who are clinging to sin and destroying God's people in the end of time. He treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. He has to destroy his enemies to rescue his friends in the end of time, my friend. John goes on and says, I saw the beast that one from the sea and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet, the one that comes up out of the land that we're going to talk about, who deceives those who receive the mark of the beast. We're going to talk about that mark of the beast because that's part of God's end time scenario that's going to take place. We must understand these things. These two, those two beasts were thrown alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the rest, that's those who followed these beasts, those who gave their allegiance to them, sadly they are killed with the sword of him who sat on the horse. My friend, God doesn't want to do this. But he has to do this. If you have a rotten apple in a barrel, it will turn everything else rotten. God now around the world is giving people to make a course correction. He's giving time. He's pleading with people, change, turn to me to have life. God is not trying to scare us here. He's telling us the reality. What would you think of a parent who said to their child, don't play on the road. It's a dangerous place to play on the road. 
You say, it's better to play inside because you're safe and we've got lovely things in the backyard and you'll enjoy, but don't go on the road, you might get killed. So one day, mummy is at the kitchen window looking out across to the front road and she sees little tiny, little Essie Kelly or Romina playing on the side of the road. Mummy is not going to sit there and wonder for a while Oh, I don't want to hurt her feelings. I must go and talk, quietly go up to them and tiptoe and whisper up and say, don't play on the road, the truck might come. She's not going to do that. She's going to open that window. She's going to scream out at the top of her lungs, Sally, Johnny, Romina, whoever you are, Issa Kelly, get off that road. The truck is coming. Is she not? Why? Not because she's trying to scare the little kid, because she's trying to save their little child from death. It's the same with God. He can see a truck coming, as it were. He can see that these evil powers are going to seek to take all the world to destruction. He can see it all. And so he said, John, warn my people. Write these things so that people can make a course correction and not be on the wrong side. That's why God does these things, because of love for his children, whom he made and redeemed at the cross of Calvary. Oh, my friend, John, in the early parts of Revelation, gives us another picture of the coming of Jesus. He says the sky is going to roll back like a scroll. In ancient times, they had scroll books that rolled up. The sky is going to roll back like a scroll rolling up. Every mountain and island was removed from its place. This is in the coming of Jesus. Then every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Do you see, my friend? There is coming a day that God could see is coming when people will call for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and to hide them from the Lamb, the same Lamb who died for them, they run from. Oh, my friend, today, there will be no place to hide on that day unless we're hiding now in Jesus Christ, we will run from him then. Oh, that's why he calls us. Come, come while time remains. Come while we have an opportunity. Accept my free grace and my invitation or we will run on that day. We must hide ourselves in Jesus now. Now is the time to say, oh God, I accept Christ. I hide in him so that on that day we are not afraid. We look up with joy, the Bible says, and we say, this is our God. We've been waiting for him, the friend who died for us, our husband friend, as the Bible puts it. So that's why Jesus is going to come, my friend. He is coming to raise his friends who have died to life. He's not going to leave them in the mossy old grave. He's going to wake them to life. He's coming to reunite his friends so that we will be reunited with loved ones. He's coming again to give his friends new young bodies, forever youth. I'm looking forward to that day. He's coming to take his friends to live with him. He's not going to say, you live there and I'll live here. No, God is a lover and he wants to live with his people. Just like a husband and a wife like to live together if they love each other in the same house. God is going to take his friends to live with him. He's going to have to deliver his friends, however, from their enemies to do that. And that's that sadder picture that takes place when Jesus comes for his friends. But it must take place. So now how will the 11th scenario play out? We see now why he's coming. Why Jesus' coming is the most blessed event in earth's history. Aside from him dying on the cross so that he can take us home when he returns. How is it going to take place? 
You know, my friends, the second coming of Jesus is going to be the world's most spectacular sound and light show that has ever been seen on planet Earth. It's going to make the Sydney Harbour fireworks that take place every new year look like it's someone lighting a candle in the dark. God's second coming with Jesus comes to take his friends is going to be awesome. Notice what the Bible says. Jesus is talking to his friends who want to know what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the world. And he tells them how he's going to come. As the lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, even so will be the coming of the Son of Man when he comes. My friends, like lightning, flashes from one end of the sky to the other. You see it, it's visible. My wife and I and our two daughters lived and had the privilege of living in Michigan in the United States of America some years ago. And let me tell you, they had the most awesome thunderstorms that I've ever experienced. We have some pretty big ones in the Northern Territory of Australia. This was massive. You could put your head under the pillow pull all the blankets over and you could still see the lightning. I remember one day the thunder boomed when the lightning flashed. I thought the thunder was right on top of me inside the, the room that day. Awesome. You see it. You hear it. And that's Jesus' point. When he comes, it is very visible, like the lightning flashing across the sky. The Bible says, Jesus went on to say, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear. He's going to be seen. He appears in the sky. And all the nations of the earth will mourn. That's those nations, those people who have decided not to follow and accept God's way of having eternity. They will mourn. They will see. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and glory. He will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect. Means those who have put their trust in him. Those who have said, yes, Jesus, I accept what you did at Calvary. Those who are following him. His elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. The Bible is very plain. It's going to be visible. You're going to hear things on that great day. Somebody's been going, to, going to be blowing a trumpet. In fact, the Bible says there's going to be many of them blowing trumpets, the angels of God, when they come to gather his elect, his friends. Biggest trumpet I ever saw was this one in Switzerland. What a monster that one was. That's got nothing compared to what it's going to sound like when on that day myriads of angels are going to blow their trumpets because they're coming for the greatest event of time to take God's children home to be with their forever friend. You see, my friend, the second coming is not a secret coming. There are some today, tragically, who believe in a secret coming, some sort of a secret rapture. The Bible, you can see, doesn't support such an idea, in fact. This is no secret rapture. This is the most audible and visual event of the ages. He's coming like a thief in the night. Some people think that means he's going to tiptoe quietly into this world and take some people out. But my friends, that's not what he means when he says he's coming like a thief in the night. He means he's coming unexpectedly. When you don't expect him to come in, he's coming unexpectedly. Notice what Paul said when he wrote. He said, keep watch. In other words, don't party on dude have that sort of an attitude. Let's eat, drink and be merry sort of an attitude. Be watchful, be alert, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have left his house be broken into. So, he says, you also must be ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. 
He's not coming secretly, Paul says. He's coming unexpectedly. When you don't think he's coming. That's why he's coming as a thief in the night. In fact, you know, my friend today, Jesus warned us against teachings that talk of a secret coming of Jesus. The Bible warns us against such teachings. Notice, Christ is coming unexpectedly like a thief. And here's what Jesus said. If they say to you, look, he's in the desert, out there somewhere, do not go out. Or look, he is in the secret chambers. He's come secretly. Do not believe it. My friend today, these are the words of Jesus. He's shown us how he's coming, why he's coming, the most spectacular event, the most hope-filled day on our human horizon. He's not coming quietly. He's coming publicly. He's coming plainly. He's coming powerfully. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, as the disciples, the 11 disciples were with Jesus, they suddenly saw him begin to rise and go into heaven. They saw him go up from them into heaven, the Bible says. And then when they looked around, after they looked, stopped looking up, they looked around and they saw two angels. And this is what the angels said. You men from Galilee, why are you standing there gazing up into heaven like this? This same Jesus. I'm glad it's the same Jesus. The same Jesus that touched lepers and put his arms around them with smelly bodies because their flesh was rotting, but Jesus loved them. The same Jesus that could say to a woman who just said goodbye to her son, why are you crying? And raised that boy to life. The same Jesus that sat little children on his knees because they loved to look into the face of Jesus full of love. The same Jesus that could say to a prostitute, I forgive you, go and sin no more, I love you, go and live a good life. The same Jesus that was here on this earth, the same Jesus said the angels, he's coming in the same way as you saw him go. He went in clouds, it says in Acts, he's coming the same way. He went visibly, he's coming back visibly. These are the words of God and his angels and Jesus, my friends. Jesus is coming. The greatest event of all the ages is about to take place. But my friends, there are only going to be two groups on that day when Jesus comes. The saved, those who have accepted Christ, who are walking with Jesus, following him, let him write his laws on their hearts. The saved and the lost. There's no middle ground. We're either lost or saved on that day. My friend, which group will you be on among on that day? Will you be welcoming Jesus with joy on your face because of what he's done for you in dying for you? Or will you be running from him and seeking to hide from this same Jesus only two groups my friend that's all the Bible says the question is how can we be ready how can you be ready for that great day how can you look into the face of Jesus with joy welcome him as the one who loves you so much as he does a little girl was lost she began to cry like little kids do when they can't find mummy or daddy in a big crowd she began to cry her heart out and a policeman came up to her and he said say little girl what's the problem I've lost my mummy she called out and cried out I want mummy I can't find her he was able to calm her down enough to say to her, now, what's your name? 
She said, I'm Susie, Mr. Policeman. He said, Susie, I want to help you find your mummy and your daddy. What's your mummy's name? Well, Mr. Policeman, daddy calls mummy darling. Well, that wasn't helping the policeman too good, was it? So he said, well, listen, Sally, Susie, I mean, Susie, what's your daddy's name? Well, Mr. Policeman, mummy calls him honey. He wasn't getting anywhere. He couldn't help this little girl find her way home. So he said to her, Susie, Susie, is there something near your house, something big, so that if we could find that big thing near your house, we could find your home from that big thing? Or she scratched her head for a while, and finally Susie said, yes, Mr. Policeman, there is something near my house. She said, there's a big church near my house, and on top of the church, there's a big cross. Mr. Policeman, if you can get me to the cross, I can get home from the cross. My friends, that's how you're going to get home, to the heavenly home. There's only one way home, my friend, the way of the cross. It gets us home. When we come to the cross, we can get home from the cross. Listen as the choir sings our final song today. Listen carefully and place your life in God's hands. Listen carefully and say, oh Lord, I'm going to be among those who are saved. I'm going to be one of those who welcome Jesus and don't run from Jesus because Lord, I'm coming to the cross. My friend, as the choir sings today, there may still be some, I'm sure there are some who have not yet made that decision. And you want to say, Lord, this is my moment. I'm going to stand. I just want you to stand where you are, where you are, to say, God, I'm accepting this Jesus because I can get home from the cross. If you've not yet given Jesus your life, but right now he's been speaking to you, I want you to stand as the choir sings and one of our ushers is going to give you a piece of card so you can write your name on there and we can get you some literature to help you with your decision. You may be in Raki Raki this afternoon or Lautoka or there at Tavu or someplace you're watching on the internet. You can give your life to Jesus by saying, Lord, I accept the Christ of the cross. I can get home from there. Won't you stand today if you're one of our downlink sites or right here in the Vodafone? If you've not yet given your life to Jesus, you've wandered far from him, this is your moment. You stand to your feet while our choir sings. You stand. stand right where you are now.
anybody who needs to stand. You know God is talking to you. You haven't yet made that decision, but you know you need to stand. God bless you. Are there some others you want to stand? Our ushers can give you a card so that we can get literature to you, help you with your decision. God bless you. We are so glad you've been standing and others at Downlink sites. I want you to take that card and just circle number one when you get it. I'm accepting Jesus. I'm saying, Lord, I'm coming home via the cross. I turn from my sin and I give my life to Jesus. You circle number one. Circle C, you'd like some written material on our programs. You'd like to borrow the DVDs. Make sure you fill out that card. Ushers, make sure everybody has that card who needs one. And then hand it to the ushers when you've finished. I'm so glad you made that decision. Let's bow together in prayer to close our program this afternoon. Oh, Father. What a day of hope. No wonder Paul said, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour who gave himself for us. Oh, we thank you so much, Father, that this Jesus, this same Jesus is coming again. We thank you so much, Father, for those who have stood to say, Lord, I want to go home when Jesus comes for his friends that's why I'm coming to the cross because I can get home from the cross by accepting Jesus as my saviour thank you for so many decisions that were made today by people bless every one of us in our homes listening on the radio watching on the internet in the downlink sites and here keep our hand in the hand of God God has promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. I am with you always. Thank you, Father, for great love that you have shown to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.